Hello, James. Hello. How do you like my new sweater? Sweater. It's got nipple zips. Zipples. For what? Shirt pockets. Oh, I thought that's that's a sweater for new mothers. <laughs> Like a nursing sweater. <laughs> <laughs> Way to start it off. All right. Oh Wait my God, start. are we recording? Yes. This is oh okay. my God. That's that's the uh, cold. That's open. going in the recording. <laughs> that's the cold open. <laughs> Welcome to the video. <laughs> wow. There can be only one. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Greetings, Earthlings. Welcome to Cinema Royale's alien episode. I'm your host, Lloyd from Space, also known as Mike Mixtape. If you caught that reference, you're awesome. <clears throat> Along with me are my awesome film connoisseurs. Let me introduce you to them one by one just for your pleasure. To my right, far right, for your viewing pleasure, is Matt Brunet, also known as Anna Matt. Yep, 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 uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Hey guys, hey guys, hey guys, uh huh. Yep, 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 yep. Are you supposed to say ring, ring? Nah, it's not on. Oh, nah. Skype, 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 Skype. Yep, yep, yep. Skype, Skype. <laughs> that should be a new one. <laughs> the man in the middle is James Sullivan, also known as Jaime Tude. <clears throat> Two Nights broadcast is brought to you by Norman Bates stuffing a bird and me being caught with the name... Or stuck with the name James Sullivan for the next sixty days on Facebook. Yeah. Really? Well, you should know what the oh. Facebook name policy is. Once you change it, you have to wait until you change it again. <laughs> Twitter is simple. That's Twitter, why I did it on Twitter. Is simple. That's why I did it on Twitter. Twitter is simple. You can change it whenever you want. Uh. You don't do it on Facebook. You keep. <laughs> Soul of it. Soul of it. It's a. He's. I got, he's soul. got a soul. It's like a jazz he's, man. He's the jazz man. He's, he's a yeah. soul man. See? Yeah, he man. He's got, soul he's got a dual purpose. <laughs> <laughs> See? He's a soul <laughs> man. Last. <laughs> Last but not least, the woman on the left is <laughs> Sylvie, also known as Shaman Pretzel. <clears throat> Hello, happy November, and I don't care if it's post-Halloween, I'm still going to wear my Halloween costume. Pikachu! 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 So, welcome to Cinema... At first I thought it was just a raincoat or something. I like something. a good woman in yellow. I was gonna say, I was... Yeah, she's got the best one. <laughs> she dressed up as April O'Neil or something? I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, welcome to... Although There's actually a reason for it, but I'll get into it later. Welcome to Cinema Royals Sci-Fi Month, and we begin with the discussion about... Aliens. You know, we're in a galaxy far far away and there's a lot of possibilities there are life beyond earth you know there's a lot of films about aliens there's a lot of you know people like i seen a ufo that's ufo over there 
So we're going to discuss the depictions of... A lot of movies answering the question, who did it? Aliens. Exactly. We're going to talk about uh, possibilities of what aliens are depicted as in films. And, of course, I asked these guys ahead of time what they're going to do, and it's interesting to see what the, these guys have come up with. So, let's start out with Sylvie, with her pick of an anime, which I'm interested to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, there's there's many, you know, with the subject like anime, there's many that you can pick, because it seems like 90% of them have to do with some sort of extraterrestrial obscure one and I almost kicked myself for missing this because I love this year. it's like the perfect week to do it um, so the anime is the 2001 um, OVA uh, Alien 9 it's not a movie it's actually a four episode series yeah I noticed, I noticed was, that it was like what? Uh, four episodes wait OVA or OVA OVA or it's OVA, right? I guess how you say it. V or OVA, yeah. But it's, it's an anime series, but it's very it's very short. Yeah. But it's very fulfilling. I actually prefer shorter animes because I feel like they can pack more into it as opposed to your Dragon Ball Zs or Sailor Moons or even Attack on Titan where they kind of really like stretch everything out like episode after episode after. I like the small compact animes. Um, and I really liked this. So, uh, it came out in 2001. It's uh, about a group of three girls who are elected to uh, encounter aliens or um, aliens sort of land on their school. They, I think they go to a junior high or an elementary school. And they're tasked with capturing, apprehending the alien. And... It, it's there's three girls, but it mainly centers around. Uh, she's the one that really, really doesn't want to be in the group. Uh, in fact, her class, her class nominated her, and she's shy, she's timid, she hates aliens. Uh, she keeps saying, "I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I hate this. I'm scared. I'm scared." And it sucks because no one seems to want to listen to her. It's like, "Oh, you'll do fine. You just have to quit whining, suck it up." You know, and no one seems to listen to her, and it, you, you really feel for her. And her two teammates, who seem to be naturals at it, there's uh, uh, the character Kumi, who's uh, this tall girl who's um, fiercely independent. Uh, she She's uh, always been the class president for every grade that she's been. And she basically takes over her mother's uh, writer work, like doing the accounting, the bookkeeping, everything. So she, she's never really had a childhood. And then there's uh, this little petite uh, perfectionist uh, uh, rich girl name. She's just happy. Like throughout the entire series, you see her smiling. She says, "I do it because I like it." She's like perfect at math, at at swimming, at uh, at alien, at the alien uh, uh, group. So basically, the whole the whole four episode series is about them. Um, fighting the um, dealing with these aliens, and they 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 fight these aliens all the while wearing alien. Mm. Mm. Like salamander Kirby things with wings, um, called Borgs. They're very they're very Pokemon like. So they put them on their head, and it actually forms like a symbiotic bond with them. So they kind of sense each other's uh, feelings. They can, I guess, communicate. Um, the Borgs actually feed off them by using, like, their tongues and, like, sticking it to their back. It's really, really creepy. Borg? Yeah, it's called the, it's called the Borg. Um, maybe I could let's see if I could find they a get, picture. Do they get there. assimilated or something? Um, I, I don't want to say too much about it, but because there, there are some elements. Aren't answered. I think that's liked about it because, like four episodes, there's really a lot that they don't give away. Like there's so many 
un un unanswered question episode, you're just like, what? What happened? Uh, I guess just to backtrack, um, I, I compare this really mainly with the show uh, Mado uh, Mahu Shoujo Madoka Magica in that it looks cute and, you know, like the characters have big moe eyes and mm -hmm. like, you know, like little, they have uh, like the, that very, it, it does look like it has that very cutesy anime style to it. You know, like you, you'd expect like a little cutesy little fun time, like, oh my god, oh my god, he's so good, so senpai. Yeah, exactly. It's very. In fact, like the reason why I'm wearing, <laughs> the reason why I'm wearing this is because it does give off a vibe because you have to keep in mind this is like two years after I can't remember two or three years after Mewtwo Strikes Back or maybe one year after Pokemon 2000. So it, it does kind of give off a deceptively Pokemon-y vibe with all the aliens. Um, and actually, what's what's a, a real big nod to it is two voice actors in particular. Uh, Veronica Taylor and Rachel Lillis um, have some prominent roles in the in the in the voice acting. Um, Veronica Taylor being sorry, Rachel Lillis being the voice of Misty. She's the voice of Miu, which is uh, Yuri's best friend. Mm -hmm. And there's there's this big sort of nod, nod, nod wink, wink, where there's a kid. They're not major characters, but they're just playing and they're catching a cicada. And you could hear Veronica Taylor, Ash Ketchum's character. He's like, yeah, I got him. Yeah, I got to catch them all. And then they run off. It's like, oh, I can't believe they did that. So they do that. They know they know what they're going for. They're trying to make it out to be something cute. But these characters are in real, like, physical danger every time they go out to protect the school. These these monsters are, some of them have are like bulls and they have these big ramming horn fists. Mm. They terrify so I I definitely 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 recommend this uh, this uh, show especially if you've ever seen Madoka Magica because I loved Alien 9 so I loved uh, Madoka Magica for the same reason because it's kind of taking these girls these innocent girls and they're just putting them in these horrifying like psychologically damning situations. just I love it I don't know why but um, unlike unlike Magica it, this one it has a it has a manga, so if you if you do want to fill in the blanks with the series, um, you could go and actually read up like extra because it stops the actual anime stops abruptly like midway, mm -hmm. and there is more to it. But um, yeah, I I I would recommend recommend the dub just for the little nods there. And mm -hmm. interesting, mm. interesting. I was like. What? It's like it got canceled in four episodes. Like what? I, I I think it's based on the manga. Actually, I think the manga came out before the OVA, so you can actually read up on it. Mm -hmm. So you can mm -hmm. just see what it's based on, actually. But you know, right. with that, yeah. you know, with the Pikachu outfit, like I, I thought you were gonna talk about, um, like I thought you were gonna go into like Destiny Deoxys or something like that. <laughs> I, I have not seen that one. Really? This, yeah, no. I don't watch too many anime anymore. That one was like way back when I was crazy into anime. But to this day, this remains one of my favorite series. But no, I haven't seen Destiny Deoxys. Oh, all right. Mm. Cool, cool. So, any, it, it's been a long time, but yeah. Well, it looks like a but cute I show. I thought you were going to get into that. Yeah. yeah. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled, James. If you watch it, like especially the episode four, you're going to be like, what? What you just me doing that like two minutes yeah. after the credits roll? You're like what? Just wondering. Trust me. The accurate, Sylvie. What's that? Oh, this pic. Oh. Ah. Oh. Oh. Let me see. Yeah, oh, this alien name. Yep. Pretty much. <laughs> For sure. Huh. And that's why I love it because it, it's it's sub. I don't know if I could say it's subversive, because I, I don't really know what to expect, but just looking at it, you look at the picture, and it's like, oh, it's going to be like a cutesy show about girls with like little sidekicks like Luna the Cat and stuff. No. No. Mm -hmm, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> prepare to cry. You're going to have the feels, hardcore feels with this one. Like, you went, you're you not going to go end up going, No. <laughs> no. But, no. None of that. <laughs> well, you know that's probably a good thing because I like I like 
uh, occasionally coming across a, a movie or a TV show that that plays with your expectations. You know, that's what I like yeah. a lot about Tezuka's work. It was that even though he was, uh, even though he he pretty much grandfathered the cutesy anime style, you what you actually sit down and read it. It's like, whoa, this is deep. Ew. You know, <laughs> sex and violence for little kids. Um, uh, I love it. <laughs> it's a family picture. <laughs> you know, you know, you got these girls and they wear frogs on their heads. You know, it's a family anime. <laughs> so, uh, from that spectrum, let's go to something that came out last year i believe it was a american uh, canadian Jesus. co-production kind of film and, yeah, and i believe Jesus. matt Bernay has reviewed it and he's actually here to talk about it once again yep because okay here's the thing out of all the animated features that i've seen and that i had to review this has to be possibly the most unoriginal dull, generic animated feature I have ever seen. I am talking about, of course, Escape from Planet Earth. Oh, now, based... phew. What were you yeah, thinking? What were you thinking? <laughs> uh, I sort of got a, a spoiler about, um, about what Matt was going to talk about. Oh, really? Yeah. Anyway. yeah um, so oh. I, I thought it was going to be the other no, no, one. No, no, no. 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 If that... no. That's not released. No. That wasn't released yet. Last, last year? year? I said Dude. last year, not 2002. That, that... Oh. Don't spoil it no. now. What the fridge? God. Yeah. <laughs> you gave out a big hint. Oh. Now this whole podcast is ruined. <laughs> you ruined it's... the surprise party. <laughs> like, anybody's okay. going to know. If... All right. If you people and... watching this guess it right... Fine, you spoiled it. Fine. Okay, anyways, the thing with Escape from Planet Earth, this is basically a Canyon Able story where we got this weak got this weak little alien named Gary who has to go and save Scorch, his like big dumb superstar of a brother from in Planet Earth from like at alien um, area 51. There's literally no sense of originality. The plot is very generic. The, like, the animation, it looks so dull. There's nothing creative that can really come out of it. Even the characters, like, they're just dumb. Anno like, they're just dumb and annoying. And they're just, like, they pull out all these crappy jokes just to entertain the kitties. And especially Scorch is, like, he's the kind of dumb that really annoys you. Like... Every stupid thing he does, like, always pinches a freaking nerve. And, like, oh my god. Like, you, you can see that in, in the animation, you know that, the, like, the studio can do something good out of it, but they're offered bare, like, they were offered nothing to work with. They were offered, they were offered jack all to work on it. It's like, it's just... It's so bad how generic it is, especially from something that came out last year. Like, that's freaking humiliating. And I just want to mention there is a, an explanation to this. There's something that does make sense because the production was freaking hell. It was seriously freaking hell. Apparently, uh, there was a lawsuit that went into like making this movie because Harvey Weinstein, he had no idea what to do with this movie. Like he, he had absolutely no clue what to do with it. He literally was a freaking moron working on it. Also the fact that he, like he wanted to, I think there was, a, there was a rumor. I think like he wanted to freaking kill himself. Like he was allergic to peanuts. And after watching it, like he went to like, he went like in a, this bowl full of M and M's, trying to stuff his face with it. <laughs> Apparently, they brought in like people like Kevin Bacon and Ralph Guggenheim, just completely wasting their talents for nothing. 
um, the production went on for six, six, seven years. Apparently, they had to write this 17 times. They had to rewrite the entire film freaking 17 times. I think, like, at that point, they were like, screw it. Let's just make something, like, the safest, something generic, like, whatever. You know, the sad thing is that there is a small bit of originality that they it could have been interesting. They could have done something with it. Is that apparently there was at one point they mentioned that the aliens, the aliens are the reasons why we have the modern technology. It's because of aliens we have stuff like the internet or like wireless communication, phones or stuff like that. But oh, no, so it's kind of like at World's End, then. It's something like that, a little bit, but, but they don't use that as a plot device. They use it as a freaking joke to make dumb pop culture references. Uh... There's even, there's even at one point, like, I don't get how they even reference that because of them they made Pixar, the anim like, and they even oh. have like, a caricature. Of like one of the aliens with John Lasseter, like what? Like I've never like. It just makes like the existence <sighs> of this movie is just, it's just mind blowing. Like this like is an example. Like it's normally like take that competition. <laughs> yeah, like normally, like I've seen movies that are like so dull and generic, like they're like forgettably bad, like Alpha and Omega, but like. This is the kind of unoriginality and dullness that's just painful. It's literally like like watching it, it's just a waste of 90 minutes. And it's one of the biggest examples that the Weinstein company has no idea what to do with animation, like at all. They just had that one lucky shot with Hoodwinked. That's it. Mm. And, like... Mm. How this film even, like, this this would barely pass as a direct-to-DVD film. How this ended up in, in freaking theaters is beyond me. Like, seriously. Why? And, you know, like, and one more thing I want to mention about it. How bad this movie actually is. When I posted on YouTube... It actually had a copyright notice, well, like a like a copyright identity from the Weinstein Company. The movie ended up being so bad, they took it out. They they decided to take out the copyright notice because there's no freaking point. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> That's oh. how bad it, you know it's bad when even like the movie company. This is like. Like, took out the copyright notice from YouTube because there's no point in making money out of this piece of garbage. Wow. That is... Wow. Oh, that... So, so Matt, I have a question for you. Like, yeah. in terms of production shell, production hell animated movies, is this, like, a step below, um, uh, the... What am I gonna say? The Thief and the Cobbler and a step above Food Fight? Kind of in the middle then? Or? Um, Good way well, to put it. Okay. In a sense. Actually, I could consider it... This would be... Cons I would consider it worse than both of them. Considering because, like, mm -hmm. at least even with The Thief and the Cobbler, never in that 30 years there was a lawsuit. Like, I don't think there was that much rewrites that they had to do. Like, because keep in mind, this is, okay, like, I can imagine maybe there is more than 17 rewrites for The Thief and the Cobbler during that, like, 33 years of production. We're talking about, but this, we're talking about 17 rewrites in a span of six to seven years. That's, in, that's just crazy. That's literally probably, th that's... Almost three rewrites a year. It's, I think, yeah, it's definitely worse than, I would say it's worse than like freaking Food Fight or Thief and the Cobbler. Although I do admit, I didn't look way too much into 
the production of Food Fight. All I know is that there was at one point um, the computer got stolen. I don't know mm. the rest of the thing, but <laughs> Food Fight is just <laughs> that's, that's Food Fight is another yeah, story. A whole another story for another time. Yeah, hopefully that I don't get into because I get way too many requests for that. <laughs> do food fight. Do that's food good. Fight. Especially. Especially, especially from fans of Cloudy with a Chance and Meatballs always telling me, You think that's bad? You gotta check out Food Fight! <laughs> oh, man. And you come back at them and you're like, Why would I give a butt's ass about Food Fight? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I just got it, James. I chose butt's ass. The butt's ass is back. Oh, my God. <laughs> What was that for again? Muppets Letters to Santa? Yep, yep. Yes. It was, yep, the Muppet oh episode. Oh my god. Yep, part two. Letters to Santa. <laughs> Don't give what a the... what's ass about it. <laughs> just, to, just to give you context, it'll be, I hate Muppets, um, Muppets Christmas Letters to Santa. I went full on rage. I apparently did not think about what I say, and somehow butts. I don't give a butt's ass. Kind of came out of my mouth. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, so, poetic. Oh man, let's go way the way way back machine, even further beyond Sylvia and Matt's films. Let's go back to 1978. The golden year oh. of films, in my opinion, because uh, oh. 1978 had films I, I, I consider aliens as creature features because they're creatures and they're featured in a film. You know, they attack, whatever. So, you know, for a moment, I thought you were going to talk about Mr. Peabody and Sherman. No, I was. I was <laughs> you mentioned the Wayback Machine. I, I wasn't going there, Joe. I was doing a reference as the Way Way Back Machine, dude. Can I, can I make uh, my pop culture I... references here? In my own podcast, mm. God. Yeah, but yeah, but I also like relevance. Yeah, but, yes, uh, we're all wishing for a better movie, Matt. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because anything you're gonna say, Mike, I think it's a, it's a step up from Escape from it, Planet Earth, no matter it will what. Because 1978 give us films like Jaws 2, Piranha, The Swarm, and of course, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. The remake, oh yes! yeah, remake of the original 1956 Invasion of the Body Snatchers. <laughs> I like that movie. Oh man, I, I it, was, it was on my to watch list. I was like, I have to watch this. I have not seen the original. I plan on watching the original for context because there's cameos from the original actors from the original movie in this film as well, which I didn't catch on. So I read it from IMDb apparently, but it features three, three, uh, four, three, three big name actors that I was like, really, Donald Sutherland, uh, Leonard Nimoy, and Jeff Goldblum. I'm like, what is this? Huh? What is this? So, and this is interesting because this this could be a new perspective of aliens too. Because this is a this is an interesting kind of alien for you. Because mm-hmm. the uh, the body snatchers are uh, at the beginning of the film. You notice that it's set in space, and you see this whispering, you know, fuzz. And I'm like, what the fuck am I watching? Like, and it floats down to Earth and. It starts growing into plants. It's like a, a pod with a flower on it, and that start it starts to circulate around San Francisco, which is set in. And at first, uh, it, you get this female lead. I don't know her name. I don't know the actress, but she's throughout the whole film, and she's she doesn't know what the flower is. She's like, "This ain't in the flower book. This ain't in the, I don't know what the flower is." Puts it on the side of of her by her clock and I'm like thinking dude that's gonna be a plot point in the film okay let's just get it going her boyfriend Jeffrey oh man this kind of flipped me out when I was watching this cause Jeffrey is like this slob kind of guy he's watching football on the TV and then all of a sudden you start to see something happening to Jeffrey 
you don't know why, but later on you catch on. It's like, oh, is that what happened? No, that's pretty cool. Jeffrey changes into a completely different man. He's like this formal guy, emotionless. He's like, I'm going to have to go to a meeting tonight. I have to go, honey. Let's go. I'm not going to. I gave my tickets to the football game to a patient. I'm not, what am I? And he's a dentist. And he's just, and she's, and the girlfriend's like, what the fuck is going on here? Not literally, but it's just like, that something's happening to my boyfriend. And, and all of a sudden, everywhere else in San Francisco, it's happening. Donna Sutherland plays this health inspector. His first scene is actually pretty hilarious because he goes to his restaurant and expects it. And he's like, you see what this is? What is this? It's a caper. No. If it's a caper, you would eat it. This is a rat turd. <laughs> Kevin, what? He put, he put a rat turd in, 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 some, in a soup, I believe. So you just picked it like, this is a rat turd. You get... Well then! Mm. Something random, but um, so he's along with her and trying to solve this kind of mystery. Leonard Nimoy plays this psychiatrist, this doctor, and boy, he's got a twist on him. I'm not gonna reveal it, but geez, it's just like at first you're like you think he's normal, but then you realize, yeah, um. He tries mm -hmm. to help out. He's trying to be the um, state of mind. Like, you know, it, it can't be aliens, you know? It's, it's just something in your mind. It's like, you know, they change. People change. You gotta just got to move on, and man, and just do stuff like that. Jeff Goblin plays this uh, random... Um... Guy? Yeah, some random guy who um, you... has a wife, and... They he they get discovered. Oh, I think Jeff Goldblum plays this this book deal kind of guy. He's in the book signing. He's got a, he wants his poetry to be let out in the world. He's a he's in his mess too. I don't know why. And God, this is a very suspenseful movie. The music. I I've ne I never talked about the film score in any other film in this podcast, but the film score in this is fantastic. It it drew me in. I was like so like, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Ah! What's gonna happen, man? Um, mm -hmm. you you realize later on that um, the pod and the flower, of course, is the alien portion of it. The the pod kind of I didn't figure it out until I couldn't figure it out till later on because as you sleep, this pod kind of he just took, takes just over. Takes, just kind of inches over, try to take your your inst your your soul and your looks and oh my god, it was very gruesome when I seen this scene and they they talk about they show uh, these flowers and they're huge, they're big pods and you see Dollar Sutherland's character uh, try to stay awake but he falls asleep and that pod's trying to get him and all of a sudden. Um, Jeff Goldblum's wife Nancy, he she knows like, wake up Matthew, wake up Matthew, and you see all the pods in that area. And it's like, whoa, whoa, it's creepy because it's like a little fetus that comes out, and all of a sudden it grows bigger and bigger into the adult form of the person. It's duplicating. Yes, it's a alien duplicator. Otherwise, and it's just. Mm -hmm. I'm speechless. I'm speechless. Mm. This film is like one of the best I've ever seen. Hands down. The ending alone just makes you like, really? There's no resolution to this thing? There's no resolution to this problem? You just see th that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, what's what's interesting about this film, and I, I, um, I, I, I did watch this, and after after watching it, I, I, I sat back, I watched the special features on the DVD and whatnot, and I learned a lot of interesting things. Um, they, at uh, there are several 
scenes, there are certain ways that they that they um, that they use to out establish the takeover of of, uh, of people in this in this film, and uh, they they'd invented this special type of portable camera in order to in order to film part of it. I think uh, no, no, maybe it was. Um, it wasn't exactly invented per se, but um, it was it was just a very uh, compact camera. I think uh, at the time, relatively new, and they, in order to, there there are scenes with uh, Kiefer Sutherland, uh, sort of rapidly charging through crowds, looking at everybody, wondering if it uh, if anybody around him could be could be an alien or not mm-hmm. and to do this scene they didn't they actually did it pretty cheap they actually had Dennis Sutherland a uh, Kiefer no, no no Donald Sutherland not Kiefer Sutherland Donald Sutherland uh out on the street following a cameraman and it was that they just went out on a busy San Francisco street and they were passing through people and he was bumping into them so they that that whole bit there was pretty much was pretty much off the cuff and they have these shots in the film where where um where there's buses driving by and people just sort of staring out the window that those were not actors either. Those were just people that they filmed on the bus looking out the window. Mm. And this is why this movie is scary, because uh, because they they capture what is the the essence of real life. You know, at the end of the day, people are just sort of worn out. Ha- so a lot of people just have less personality, and uh, that's what um, that's sort of what this this movie proposes is the the threat being a world without individuality. You know, you hear critics saying all the time, like characters are one dimensional. Now there is a reason they're controlled by aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I um here here's part of the uh here's part of the uh the legacy that this film has. Um I was watching I was watching Animal House this past year and uh Sutherland plays uh a school te- uh, a, a professor in there at the college that the movie takes place in. And uh, there's one part where there's one part where um, where he's he's making breakfast in the morning and his pants fall down. You get a nice look at his buttocks, and uh, I was just like, oh! <laughs> "What?" <laughs> right when it happened. What? <laughs> and for the longest. Well, when I was watching the film, I was like, okay, I understand. I understood the whole body snatcher thing, and I was like, okay, but where does the original body go? And I'm thinking, where's the original copy? And I'm thinking, they're dead. And I'm thinking, like, wait, 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 did they just take them somewhere, or did they die? And I'm thinking, and later on, you they you realize that they 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 start they start to like crumble into dust, and I'm like. Oh, so that's why Jeffrey was sweeping that dust and putting it in the trash and taking it to the garb. That's why they show the garbage truck with the dust and oh, it's just like oh my god. They sort of mm-hmm. the bodies sort of deflate, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, they they kind of yeah, they they deflate into existence. It's just and then poof. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that is genius. I it just took me a while to connect the dots and I was like, fuck, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, the one thing I really got to mention about Invasion of the Body Snatchers is that um, during my teen years, uh, me and my friends, um, I think we were in summer camp, and we and we made this movie pretty much like we made 
like our own homemade invasion of the body snatchers movie and my god it was like it like I, it really gave me a good idea of what this movie was all about and like it like the concept and the, and the whole idea it really is frightening like it is kind of a frightening idea because like this is this is kind of your typical like aliens invading earth and they're like taking over humans and stuff like that but they're doing it in a way where you least expect it and when you realize it it's kind of too late because they've already taken over like a lot of these people and the original bodies are pretty much gone like and it really is a frightening thought and it's like you never and like the thing is that you never know who like you never know who is possessed and that's the thing while well, well, like while you're watching you never know who like yeah. who is taking control yeah exactly of, yeah like who's an original person and who's an actual like alien like that's who's the like, yeah, who's the, who's the, who's the duplicate yeah pretty who's much the alien duplicate who's the duplicate yeah, just... and like and it's that suspense that keeps yeah. you going for a while uh, and, mm-hmm. and I and I just got to mention this one little story. I remember when we were filming, we actually did this one scene um, where where one of my friends reenacted the scene where the original main character from the 1956 movie, like like, is running around. It's yep. like they could be anywhere. It could happen. And we actually we shot it in the perfect way, where it looked like he got hit by a bus. <laughs> like he was standing like he was standing in the car it's like it could happen to anyone oh god <laughs> and it looks so good and it was so hilarious oh man uh, uh those were good times uh, this, i gotta tell you this, this film has a, such a big legacy in general like the original mm-hmm. is certified fresh on rotten tomatoes like 90 Eight, I believe, and then this one is ninety six certified fresh and Rotten Tomatoes. But there are two other re- remakes of this film, and they um wasn't the ninety the nineties. Asian of yes, I remember. There, there's that. a there's a ninety six version. Oh my god! Yo, but there's also this one. <laughs> You're despicable. You're despicable. You're despicable. You're despicable. <laughs> See, because I've never seen it's the just... original, but I have seen the Bugs Bunny version, and that creeped me out. So I don't know if I can handle. I was hand... say it's been a while since the real McCoy. Oh god. Oh, god. He... Oh, we lost James. That's what I'm waiting for him. Waiting for him to come. Crap. He's being. Oh crap. Oh well. All we have to do is just wait. Uh... Ah, don't worry. Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen. We're just going to wait for his duplicate to come. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. Shh. Hello. Hey, James. The aliens got to my server. We know. We, uh, <sighs> we noticed. Yeah. So, the one other thing I wanted... Uh, go on. I remember in the invasion of the bunny snatchers, I got it. Totally, I totally okay, forgot okay. about it. I was like, yeah, that Bugs Bunny shirt. Oh my god, that's awesome. Oh, that's where that came from. Okay, as a kid, I did not know that. Oh my god. It comes full circle for me. Oh my god. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Blew my mind. Anyways, James, go on. Uh, I believe the... Uh... I believe the the sound designer on this movie was uh, Ben yep, Burt. From, um, Star Wars. Yes. 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 Ben I, Burt. I did my research. Yeah, yeah, he did some. Speaking of uh, speaking of Wally. Yeah. Um. And this was uh, uh, the production of this film was around a time, which his uh, his wife was was pregnant. Am I frozen up? Um, okay. Uh, it, yeah. At least I froze oh, yes. in the right position. <laughs> so, um, uh, while, uh, while his wife was pregnant, they actually went to the doctor to, uh, to listen to the baby's heartbeat. And what he did 
was he got uh, he got a recording of the baby's heartbeat and all of the the little uh, the little fluids swishing around in there and whatnot and he, he wanted he wanted to create something uh, for this film that was sort of like a, a birthing mm-hmm. at, atmosphere. Every time the uh, every time the pop people are born, you sort of mm. hear these yes. swishing noises, yes. oh. and uh. <sighs> and uh, and a heartbeat and whatnot. And that is what you're actually hearing is the unborn son of Ben Burt. Wow, that is good trivia, man. Oh. I mean, he's this guy's son was a, a movie star before he was even born. Yeah, that, that Think about that. Props. Oh my god, that is that freaky. Is awesome. <laughs> wow. How freaky is that? It's like. Could you impress people? Like, you watch this movie, and it's like, you hear that? That's the sound of a fetus. Mm-hmm. You, you, now you can impress <laughs> you all your friends at home. Ah. Oh, God. But, yeah, the... I I don't know. I don't know if they... I have to watch the original, but this version... Blew ex- my expectations. I mean, there... Like I said, there was two other remakes after this. There was a 90... 90s remake in 96 I believe it was by who directed it was Abe Fiera Abe Fiera and that Abe Bogota Fiera Fiera (laughs) not Bogota Fiera he's uh he also did like Bad Lieutenant with uh Harvey Keitel but oh Ferreira yes yes. did I say it wrong I I am bad with enunciation I'm sorry um Yes, the star of the Driller Killer. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so yeah, but that got some good uh, reception. I think got seventy-two percent on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, which is not so bad. But seven years ago, two thousand seven, they remade it uh, with Nicole Kidman and Daniel Craig, and I've it's got some bad press, man. <laughs> yeah, you think that a big budget. Invasion of a Body Snatchers with Nicole Kidman and Daniel Craig would sound great, but no. No. I I did actually see it. It was uh, it was just sort of meh to me. I mean, you know what you know what you could call it? hmm. It's a duplicate of the original. You could call it a duplicate of one of the remakes. Uh... (laughs) The remake. The remakes. (laughs) Got into a one of the remakes. Got into a cocoon, and then the invasion came out to make something less stellar than that with less emotions. Yeah. So if you wanna, I'm to get into this awesome legacy of the Body Snatchers. Check out the original and the '78 version at the most, not the other two. Maybe the '96 version, if possible, because that gets good press. But let's just move this along to a nut. And the bunny snatchers. Yes. If <laughs> Check the, the bunny, bunny snatchers. snatchers. Yes. If God, Looney Tunes. I fucking love Looney Tunes so much. Possibly the the latest good yes. one. God, I remember. Because I'll, I'm actually surprised that it was released in '92. Believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. I totally remember watching that. Fuck, that's nostalgia for me. Fuck me. <laughs> I'm hunting rabbits. I'm hunting rabbits. I'm hunting rabbits. <laughs> so let's. Uh... Uh, I'm gonna switch computers here. Hang okay. on. <laughs> you got it, James. And intermission time. Intermission. Why is it his turn? I was just segueing into it. So segue. Let me let me oh, segue yeah. into it. Because we did so. We did yes. me. Then See, we did you. You, you got the James. pattern now. Good job. It's gonna change. Yeah, I'm gonna change it in, the, in the round two, but as, uh, say, as we okay. as, I seg, as if we get James back, I'll segue into his movie. Just as hi, yeah. Do you see him? Cause I don't. Yeah, yeah, we do. I see him. I don't. I don't. What am I the only one? <laughs> you, am I seeing you, things? You. How, I, what? I, okay, now it's on. Okay, I see okay, James. Okay, it took a while to load. Jeez. 
What the fridge? My computer's slow. It took one. Okay, yeah, I see. Yeah. All right, all right. Here I, I am. You. Here I am, nipple zips and everything. <laughs> Get out of here, Jesus. Okay, so let's go from one uh, good alien film. Let's go to an another one I love so much. It just it makes you say ack 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 ack. Mm-hmm. Wait, it's coming to me. Yep. Wait. Come on. Oh, there. Okay, I know now. Mars attacks. Mars attacks, of course. Oh. <laughs> yes. This 1996... Ve oh, very insane type of type of alien invasion for a film. Um, you know, disregarding uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, most alien invasion films follow follow a very simple recipe that's remake remake War of the Worlds and just change the name of the characters yeah that'd be good. and that is that is the kind of thing that is the kind of thing that Mars Attacks does they they take that scenario in which uh, it looks like they've got superior fire, firepower and superior weapons and everything, and then it's something silly that that defeats them in the end. Something completely yeah, unexpected. Think about it now it does make more sense. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. I, all I can say, all I can. That's all I really need to say about the plot mm -hmm. now, right? Um. But, but what does this movie have going for it? Well. Uh, it has Tim Burton directing. It has a star cast of of actors. Literally, uh, all like the best example of an all star cast. Mm hmm. And that was that was actually kind of one of the things that disturbed me about this this movie was uh, when I when I first saw it, I I was a kid. I was I was uh, 11, 12. It 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 was a little bit. I shouldn't say a little bit. It was kind of unsettling to watch uh, these people get shot and turn into turn into skeletons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it wasn't completely ter horrifying, or you would see me making another best scares list for next Halloween. Mm. But um, in any case, um, it it seemed like. This this movie, this movie seemed like it was an excuse to take as many big name actors as they could find, stick them on screen, and kill them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, wow, how many how many big name actors? Oh, well, except Tom Jones. Except Tom Jones. He's oh, the only celebrity right. that does not get killed. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess people love Tom Jones. Uh, By the way, you can add another. Like I just discovered this, you can add another celebrity onto the list, because for many of the Martians, we got Frank Welker. Mm, oh well, he. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. Well, he. Uh, it's, there's several Frank Welker, Welkers that die in the film. Then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if you want to see Frank Welker dialogue, then this is for you. <laughs> yeah, let's see what we got. Um, let's see, I'm going to pull up the movie here. Mars Attacks. Uh, I got oh. the IMDb page, so yeah, like... I got the sources. But yeah. I oh, man. The b Jack, Jack Nicholson is the president. That's like the best president. <laughs> Jack Nicholson is... An Oh, he Wasn't plays. There an entire Rob Williams he plays skit? two characters. That's right. He plays um, Jack Nelson pl he Art plays. Lad, Lad. He plays a guy who runs a casino. Yep, yep, I yep, think. That's right. I was like, wait a minute, what? What the dual role? A dual role in Mars Attacks? That's pretty cool. 
Yeah. When, upon revisiting this film for last year's War of the Worlds episode on From Pages mm-hmm. to Pictures, I, I I had a little bit more of an appreciation for it, but I, I got to say, I never would have figured that was there was two Jack Nicholsons in this movie. I mean, that's how, how well he's dressed up in, in his other mm-hmm. role here. As the president... Oh, yeah, and both versions of Jack Nicholson die. Spoiler oh. alert. Mm-hmm. Not the Nicholson. He's supposed to be a badass. Yeah, Jack Nicholson in a Burton movie dying over dramatically? Say it ain't so. But, uh. Uh. Um. And Glenn, Glenn Close, uh, playing the president, playing the, the first wife. Oh, okay, okay, yep. Dies in a very silly manner. Um. Pierce Brosnan playing a, a professor dies. Then you get Sarah Jessica Parker in it, and she's she. <laughs> she gets her head stuck on a yep. dog. <laughs> she gets her head stuck on a dog, and then she dies. <laughs> so, but yeah, Pierce Brosnan and Sarah Jessica Parker has like this love interest kind of thing going on, so they die together. I so mm-hmm. romantic. Danny DeVito plays a, a character called Root Gambler. Yep, yep. He, uh, yep. He, dies. he dies. There's also... Martin Stewart plays a press secretary. Yep. He dies. Michael J. Fox is in the movie as, uh, as Sarah Jessica Parker's wife. He dies early. And that, and that I think, was supposed to was like the most unsettling of all because this, this was the first time in a, as a kid I saw I saw Michael J. Fox die in a movie and it's like oh but he's so young and and he's he's all he's in he's Marty McFly and Marty no great Scott I need to go back to the past now and save Marty from the aliens you know you know what's what's actually really interesting as well is that there are even some celebrities here. They they weren't even famous then, but like nowadays they're pretty much big names. Because I also noticed we got Natalie Portman, we also mm-hmm. got Jack Black. Uh, mm. Let me see, are there a few others? Oh, but they were able to predict Jack Black being a celebrity because he dies in the movie too. Oh well, what do you know? <laughs> Boy, these Martians. Yes, but he dies. Uh, but oh, here's the amazing thing about Jack Black, though. Every time you see Jack Black in anything, it doesn't matter how much it sucks. He's always having so much fun doing the role. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. when he's on, he's he's going over the top, doing whatever he wants. I even saw him. A, I, I even remember I saw him on a clip on Sesame Street. He was talking. He was trying to educate kids about what an octagon was. He was like, "This is an octagon." It's awesome. It's got eight sides and everything. I'm like, whoa, he's really getting into talking to him about an octagon. So here he is in this movie playing a soldier that gets killed. And he's totally getting into it when he gets killed. Wow. He gets disintegrated and he's going. <laughs> <laughs> Although I can't really buy the fact that Jack Black dies in this movie. Because you can't kill the metal. The metal will live on. Uh, live on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that came out wrong. <laughs> uh, Tim Burton tried to kill the metal. Yeah. And he failed as his movie was smite to the ground. Yeah, Mars Attack. I. Uh, Mars sorry, Attack what? is Tim Burton's sweet, sweet love to sci fi in the 50s, pretty much. It's mm-hmm. you can see the influence on the '50s sci-fi. You can, it's very you can see it. And then the aliens have this unique, like, facial. It's just them in their uniform, but they have a they have like a glass helmet, and they are just a face with a brain on it, which is iconic because they scared the crab me as a kid. I was I when I saw it as a kid, I was freaked out. I was like. Okay, you stay away from me, Martians. You stay away from me. <laughs> oh, here's. By the way, 
Would you guys believe me when I say, well, I'm sure you guys believe me, but would you believe that this is like all this is actually based on a trading on a bunch of trading cards? Oh, I know. See, James knows. No, I didn't know that. Anybody, anybody collect? Anybody collected them? The Mars Attacks trading cards? Not okay. me. I know Morgan did, but not me. Um. Well, how else would I know? Of course. Uh. But in any case, I I do remember. I do remember. Shortly after this movie came out, there were kids walking around with T-shirts on them from the comics and the and the trading cards. And there was, uh, you know, that there were pictures of aliens shooting people up and making them disintegrate. And it was, it was kind of grim. Oh, yeah. Like, um, I just found one and, uh, oh, the lally. <laughs> this is like black humor. Whoops, wait a minute. Hold on. There we go. Wait. So what? yeah. Mm. Jesus. Yeah. Hey. La la. Oh. Yeah. 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 This was the this was going an extra level of darkness that uh, that they deliberately averted for the film, and that's why they that's kind of why they hired Tim Burton because he could. He could deliver something that was a little bit more popcorny and funny, which thankfully, I, I say thankfully, he did, because I wouldn't. I, I, I'm, there's something about this image that's too dark and 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 too manic at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like. It's like you don't know if you should be like scared or laugh at it because it's like I get the joke, but sweet Jesus, this is messed up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do have. Watching the film again, I I was I I, I was less uh, disturbed by it, of course, because I'm an adult and I see what he I see more what he was trying to do with it. He was trying to Burton was trying to. Uh, do something that was not just an ad- adaptation of these trading cards. It was a lot of the the scenes of of stuff getting destroyed and whatnot. It looked like you know mini sets uh, getting blown over. It it looked like there were there were subtle nods to like nineteen fifties nineteen sixties sci fi even. Mm. It's hard to explain. I I do also recall that it, early on in the production, the idea that the aliens should be done in stop motion was actually proposed, but they skipped over that idea because it was going to cost too much money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, guess, yeah. so what they did, uh, they went all with CGI, and here's here's a little trivia that's about to to make our all of our childhoods a little bit rosier um the sound of the of the aliens walking you know how they created it how squeak toys they took a squeak toy and walked it along the ground like this oh oh my god so when you so when you watch the movie again and you hear them marching around, think March of the Squeak Toys, because that's <laughs> what you're really hearing. Oh my oh. god, okay, wow. Wow. Mind blown. <sighs> so, let's go for round two of our films. Let's hop back onto the animated bandwagon here with the almost teased... 2002 Disney film that anime yep. will talk about. Yes, as you guys almost spoiled. <laughs> nah, anyways, um, I'm referring to, of course, uh, the 2002 Lilo and Stitch. 
Mm-hmm. What's interesting about this one is that this was made back when Disney was starting to be a bit like a bit in the downside when uh, like ap- this was right after the Renaissance and like uh, they decided to go to do other kinds of films as well. Um, like, and it's evident with like they wanted to do something like a comedy with Emperor's New Groove or more like a, a kind of like this Avatar esque um, sci fi or I don't know what to consider it like Atlantis, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, but then comes Lilo and Stitch, and I just want to say this right now my feeling towards it are pretty much the same as Doug Walker's, so you'll find a lot of similarities to what I think. With Lilo and Stitch, I gotta say, it is good. Like, this is a generally good film. Um, the animation, like, it really is nice, especially how, like, um, this really shows how um, Chris Sanders' uh, art style really works well in animation, whether it be 2D or 3D. Um, also, uh, the, the, the biggest thing that really has going for it is the relationship between uh, Lilo and Nani. Which really isn't, which really is interesting because like they only have each other. Apparently, both their parents died, so like they can only live off of each other. They can only live off of each other, and like, and if um, Nani does something bad, then like Lilo is pretty much taken out. And so they decided uh, to make things better. They decided to bring in Stitch. So, and, and like, in, you know, and like, and just to end off with uh, Lilo and Nani is that, you know, you really do see the heart, you really do see the, like, what they're going through, and like, it really emphasizes the message of family, like, where, where pretty much the, like, the moral is pretty much Ohana means family, and family means no one gets left behind, and it really is, like, it really is one of the most heartfelt Disney films out there. But then comes Stitch, and this is where I find it, like, it's where it's not a great movie, per se. Because the thing with Stitch is that I feel like it's mostly made for the kiddies. I will admit, like, all the aliens and stuff like that, the concepts and stuff, and the designs, all very creative. But, like, compared to the Lilo and Nani relationship, Stitch does feel out of place, like being this al- like being like this alien which everybody thought it was a puppy or something like that and um, like it's a little bit straight it's like it's it's kind of strange in a way because like originally stitch is suppo- like uh, stitch was created by I'm trying to find his uh, like stitch was created by Jumba Jumba Jukiba yeah, Jumbo Jokiba in order to um, to be like this killing machine, but like apparently it was way too much um, for like the entire like galactic race. So they decided pretty much take like and then suddenly Stitch escaped and they send Jumba with another guy named uh, Pleakley to go after him on Earth, and that's where Stitch comes in. So. That's pretty much my feelings towards it. It's like, it, the problem, I guess, it's very similar to Pocahontas in a way, where, like, you got the element, like, the adult elements, which is Lilo and Nani, and the kid elements, which is pretty much Stitch and all the aliens, where they don't seem to work, they don't seem to blend well together, and they feel like two separate things, uh, instead of, like, working together to make this one amazing film that like everybody can enjoy like beauty and the beast so again a good film but i wouldn't consider it like disney's best but there is one more thing i want to mention uh the one thing that really is amazing about lulu and stitch is the uh, is the teaser trailers Mm -hmm. oh my god the way that they do it it's just so hilarious is that because you get all these memorable disney moments rather it be from beauty and the beast or aladdin and then suddenly you bring in stitch to suddenly interrupt to suddenly interrupt it like stitch either breaking the breaking the chandelier in beauty and the beast 
just coming in just to steal Jasmine from Aladdin. Or um, oh, what else is there? I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah, like Raf- Rafiki, like holding up. Holding up Stitch instead of Simba, and and all these kinds of things, and every and and all of them kind of end off the same way as like get your own movie. <laughs> oh yeah, and then there, oh yeah, there's also the Little Mermaid. It's like yeah, 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 it's yeah like she does surfing part of your world. Surf. <laughs> surf. Uh, it was yeah, that was amazingly clever. And also, what another interesting thing I want to mention is that oh my god, like I'm actually really surprised how Disney is advertising Stitch because my God, he is everywhere. When you go to the Disney parks, Stitch is like up there. Like Stitch is among like, like you see him everywhere. Like among like Mickey Mouse, Goofy, Donald, Tinkerbell. Like, like he's like, a, like, like they use him oh, yeah. all the time. It's like, oh, yeah. ridiculous. Like it makes me wonder. It's like, is Lilo and Stitch really that Are popular? You it spawned it spawned a whole yeah. franchise. I mean, you got the straight to DVD movies, yeah. but then you got the TV series that spawned from it. You got a TV series. You got an anime. Yes, the Japanese anime, also. which I was going to mention. The oh anime. My God, it's just like, are you? That that that's was weird... that was unheard of. I mean, an anime that spun off of a yes, Disney film. Just, just man. Stitch, that was weird. That was weird Stitch when I found that out. has a major influence now. It's just like it's huge. And it's weird considering like Chris Sanders nowadays. Like he quit Disney. Now he's he's at DreamWorks trying to do stuff like The Crudes and uh, How to Train Your Dragon. Yet he that like he's still he's still working at Disney doing the voice of Stitch no matter what. Rather it be for the series for the spin-off films, for Kingdom Hearts, for Disney Infinity. Like, if if Stitch is in there, like, he's going to do it. Well, yes and no. Uh, for, uh, I believe he was doing it for for a while, but... Um, no, 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 like, I'm checking his IMDb page, and it's like, he's still doing it. Yeah, and a lot of that, a lot of the stuff what you see for Disney Infinity is probably also... Recycled re- recordings. It could be too, but the stuff that they, the stuff with um, <clears throat> the stuff with uh, Stitch, the anime series. I know that's a different voice actor because none of the original voice actors wanted to come back for that crap. Um, I see. Well, I don't know because I see like Leroy and Stitch, Lilo and Stitch. The series it still says Chris Sanders. No, 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 the anime. Anime. The Japanese anime. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Japanese. That's true. Oh, yeah, Stitch. Yeah, because, yeah, because apparently it's by Ben Diskin, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, um... So, yeah, Lilo and Stitch, they they advertised it in the, in the fa- fashion that they did so they could, that they could pretty much tell you, um the viewer that um, this is going to be a different kind of Disney film and in that in that sense I do think they succeeded because they they did deliver a, a different type of film from what they usually do it's it's not often that they combine Hawaii with sci-fi yes. you know mm-hmm. um, but um Mostly the the Stitch character, he seems, you, you seem spot on about one thing is that he's really, uh, he's, his big thing is that he's a marketable character, and that's what I think uh, Chris Sanders is good at creating. Is even though I'm not really into uh, uh, how to train your dragon, uh, I do know that spawned that spawned a, a TV series. Yeah, that's, that's got true. its own thing. Uh, that's so true. He's... Like even like right now, the Crudes. Like there's going to be a sequel. Not 100 percent sure if there's going to be a series. I think, but not not really sure. But like I, I really do get what you mean. Like he like like even like Sylvie just showed us like his like even his own art style is marketable. Mm-hmm. I love his work. 
Oh, yeah, yeah everyone working at Disney cool. had to had to try and adapt to his particular art style to try mm-hmm. and to try and match it. That's yeah, because yeah, I, I remember like I saw like um, because of, like there's a diagram of what to do and what not to do. Is like because like everything with Chris Sanders, it has to be round. Like it has to be round. So rounded. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Like. Uh, here. Here's another interesting factoid about it. Um, the the climactic chase scene in this in the Lilo and Stitch yeah. was uh, originally going to be different. Um, I don't know. Who's, I don't know who's heard about this, but um, the the initial yes, you have the initial. Uh, climax that they had planned was uh, a scene in which uh, Stitch and the gang uh, basically uh, hijack an airplane to go after uh, to go after um, uh, what's the uh, ca- uh, captain? Jumbo. Oh no, captain. Cap- yeah, captain. Oh, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, oh, Cobra. No, not hell's... Cobra. Oh, oh, I'm having a brain fart. Stitch, Johnny Jumbo, Weekly. Cobra Bubble, no. Grand Council, no. David Kamuna. Gantu! Gantu. Captain Gantu. They're going after him to save Lilo, so they steal an airplane, uh, an airliner, and uh, they start flying after him rather erratically, and they this flight uh, takes them through a city, passing by buildings and whatnot, huh. and almost crashing into them. And this movie was released in 2002, but they scrapped that ending and they yeah. they oh. reanimated the climax, was, and that's still, why. Yeah, it was even though it was a year, it was still pretty hurtful for us. It, mm-hmm. I, that's a whole another tr- that, that's a uh, whole another trend in films. It's like you, there's a lot of things you got to change because. Because of that incident, it's just like, yeah, that's a whole other thing that's on. Oh, jeez, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. So, yeah, but the if if anyone's curious though, the the sequence was half finished, and it's it's up here on YouTube, so you can watch it after. Oh, really? Where? Yeah, link. Uh, yeah, I'd like to see that actually. Get you. I'm gonna see it too. Let's see what's going on. It's like that fascinating. Mm-hmm. I thought they burned what that as soon exactly as. We oh, we're we're gonna, gonna get Lilo? Apparently not. It's Disney. They keep uh, they, they keep animation cells from like 50 years ago. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm thinking like one day I want to get one. Like I like I want to buy like. It'll be a lot of money, but still, like, I want to get, I want to get myself a good animation cell. Uh oh, are you guys watching right now? Yeah. Oh. Oh no, I'm not. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait. Sorry. Oops. Oh. I, I said we were You're gonna. Flying. Watch oh, it. Sorry, I gave him, I gave the audience a sneak peek. Okay. All right. I gave him okay. a little tease. Spoilers. Okay. Spoilers. 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 Spoiler spoil alert! Snake killed okay. snake killed Dumbledore. Overall, <laughs> Lilo and Stitch is very influential because I saw it at a young age. Actually, didn't I think I saw it when I was twelve years old, and it was very cool to see Stitch. I mean, I even remember seeing Lion King one and a half, and at the end, Leo, uh, Stitch comes out of nowhere as part of the crowd that interrupts T- Timon and Pumbaa. I was mm-hmm. like, what? He's <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah that that was the end it's like i was like let's watch yeah i think it was like let's watch it again and then it all the disney characters come in it's like what <laughs> she's like, like what oh man but that's the kooky that's the kookiness of lion king one and a half that's another another good um mm. another good disney sequel that oh, it's funny that the Lion King has good sequels, oddly enough. Not as good as the original, but yeah, still. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's take it from Lilo Stitch and let's play a little tennis here between Matt and James because we're gonna jump 
back to James with his film. Which, which uh, would be yes. Garth Edwards' directorial debut, which, if you know Garth Edwards, he directed the recently um, made um, Godzilla film reboot back in May this year. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see what he started out as. And I, I heard things about it, and I'm not too sure about it. Well, it's uh, it, it's not often that you see a an alien invasion film that doesn't have you know very many aliens in it. Um, but uh, this is that type of film. It uh, it doesn't it doesn't show any invasions. It just sort of uh, it's it's one of those movies that steps into the into the universe. Uh, of the film after the invasion and it's what it's showing for the most part of the film is uh, a guy who's a photographer trying to transport a girl who's a woman who's getting married um, uh, from uh, from Mexico up to the United States but try to get past uh, uh, try to get past contaminated zones or what they've set up as contaminated zones because they have aliens in them uh, basically everything it, it's like it, it, it's like the alien invasion has just sort of set uh, everything back to a third world type of country but um, a lot of the film was shot in Mexico and while watching it, I realized something. I had seen parts of this movie before. In in uh, tutorial videos. Oddly enough. Uh, I couldn't believe what I when it when it dawned on me I realized, oh my goodness, this is this is what I was seeing a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a a piece of software called Mocha. Uh, which is uh, which is a program used for motion capture or motion tra motion tracking, I should say. That means if you have a if you have a, an object in a scene that needs replacement, it uh, uh, the it creates a digital camera and tracks the movement of the scene on the computer so that you can replace whatever object uh, you want replacing with something else. For example, um, there's a scene where they go to a travel agency, uh, and they're trying to uh, they're trying to uh, get safe passage from Mexico up to the United States. And uh, at one point, the uh, at one point the the travel agent signals over towards uh, he signals over towards uh, this sign on the wall behind him and it says uh, it says contaminated zones and it shows a map of different areas that have been that have been alien infested and in the original shot it wasn't a map at all it was actually they they did not shoot this scene in a travel agency. They shot it in a Mexican restaurant, and the guy was pointing at a menu. Cool. The magic of special wow. effects. Really? So they just replaced a menu with a travel agency? Well, they. Yeah, something like that. It's a uh, they they tra they replaced a menu with a map for a travel agency saying here are the infected areas, here's the non-infected areas. <laughs> so instead of the infected areas, it's <laughs> he's pointing to where the tacos and the burritos are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, the magic of monsters! Oh my god. 
Oh, would you, would you like to see our prices today, eh? <laughs> Look, it's only three ninety nine if we order two. Just, just, you know, what are we you, gonna do? you just take the map, you just rip it, and the menu's right behind it. <laughs> <laughs> this actually opened up so many ideas for me when I when I realized what I was watching, because I was thinking, you know what, if uh, if there was an alien invasion, and just just think of all the different new cuisines that would that would pop up. You know, are the aliens edible? Are they sentient? Would we would we start thinking about this after the fact and be like, oh well, um, them's good eating. Let's see. <laughs> well, technically, wait a minute. That's called District Nine. Is anybody talking about that? No. Okay. Uh -oh. Okay. Really? Nobody? Really? That would have been I mean, a great movie to talk would, about. actually. Yeah. Yeah, I only saw part of District 9. Really? Dude. What? Really? Although I can't really... It, but... you tell, you tell it. Although I can't really take... Uh, I can't really take District 9 since the main character there, he's now like the crazy king in Maleficent. <laughs> oh, God. Something like that. So, as far as how good the movie actually was, I understand that they were working with something low budget, but um, it's uh, you don't you you see the aliens in the beginning and you see the aliens in the end, and, but in the meantime, what what you're actually watching is mostly a lot of padding and a lot of build-up in it. The film... Uh, the film does... I hate to say it, but I think he did better with Godzilla because it, it does not... Um, it does not pay off in the end uh, as much as... as much as we'd hoped. We, we see the aliens in the end and we're... we're not... It's not an action scene or anything. It's not. It's not all that suspenseful. It's actually just sort of smooth and serene and peaceful. Even though they're hiding, even though they're hiding out from aliens. Um, I, I don't think that's the that's quite the the mood that you're you're supposed to create when you're you're dealing with a menace. Yeah. At least, that's. That's the type of uh, uh, that's the type of alien movie that they have here. Is a uh, alien being a menace? Huh. Interesting. Uh, as opposed to other movies where aliens be friends, like uh, another movie that's going to come up here, I think. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that segue, James. And yes, I did spoil James of what all of us are talking about. So James and I know what all of us are talking about. So. Anyways, uh, Sylvie, who is Paul? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Paul is a rude, crude, chain-smoking, uh, swearing, uh, little midget stereotypical green alien played by Seth Rogen in the 2000 popular movie, Paul. It's one of those kind of buddy road trip comedy movies. Um, it's uh, it's basically about uh, two geeks, two British geeks, uh, who just left Com San Diego's Comic Con. Um, they're played by uh, Nick Frost and Simon Pegg. Um, if those names sound familiar to you, they're uh, the two British gentlemen from Shaun of the Dead, uh, Hot Fuzz. Uh, what's the last one? At World's, World's End? End? At World's End. Yeah, yeah the, the Cornetto End. Trilogy. All of which so, are better films. Yes, yeah, thank you. Because when you see those comic gold, especially Shaun of the Dead, I love Shaun of the Dead. But, yes? Oh. Oh, the, there was some breaking up there on my end. Yeah, same oh. here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. It was Skype. We can hear. Skype being a bitch. <laughs> so, 
so but when you watch the movie it the chemistry's not there it seems a bit off and the reason why is you have to look behind the scenes and realize uh in the case of the cornetto trilogy uh i believe it's written by a third third gentleman edgar wright and simon pegg yep. and i think Ed- uh, and Paul, um, some another gentleman by the name of Greg. Mat- I don't know if I'm saying Matola? his name right. Yeah. Matola, yeah. And he's he's the guy. He he directed Super Bad, so a lot of kind of the sort of stoner kind of what's it, who's it mm-hmm. sort of romancy yeah. type films. So you're gonna get a different brand of of comedy with it. Not to say that it's bad, but it's it's not. It just it feels a bit disjointed, Paul. I'll, I'll just give the plot briefly. You know, it's your a standard. Bit disjointed. <laughs> okay, it's very like disjointed. E.T., I guess. E- and e- like go home, uh, go find the mothership movie. It, it's this basic typical um, plot where they're trying to get him to a certain meeting point where they they can he can be beamed up to to space, and you know you've heard it over and over. Um, it's uh what i didn't like about it like I, the first time i saw it i was really disappointed i was actually i think i saw it the first time i watched it again today and i hate it less like it's still not a great movie but i i can kind of appreciate it more because um they do they do take the care to sprinkle in a lot of sci-fi references i i think to its credit the movie is self-aware it's kind of borrowing from other films sci-fi and otherwise there's some in some instances they're not even borrowing from sci-fi films there's a scene where two guys are racing in a car and one one character yells out i'm on a mission from god so at some point it it doesn't even they don't even care where they're pulling the references from and i'd like to say one thing about this movie is um it it would make a good drinking game and I, i say this because you could take a drink every time a character sees Paul and faints because they overuse that gag way too much. Like it, it's 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 tired after the first two times, but they keep using it over and over and over again. And or any time uh, Kristen Kristen with the character by the name of Ruth, that uh, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost character, kind of unintentionally, um, um, she plays this theologist or like this Christian fundamentalist that totally has her world flipped around when she sees Paul. So I, I didn't even uh, get that that character. That character really annoyed me in the in this movie. <laughs> Christian Wig? Yeah, I I didn't I didn't get her either when I first saw it. Like I, I think it's cool now, now that Christian Wig's so big. Because I think when I first saw it, like I think Bridemaids had just just come out. So I don't think her that elevated but think how big she's gotten. But yeah, her character she, she, she has like this newfound lease on life when she finds out that I guess a, a, a God doesn't exist according to Paul. So she's like, I can, I can drink and I can swear and I can fornicate and do everything I want. So for the next, for the rest of the movie, all she does is just spurt out like, uh, swear, swear jargon. And she had like some, she makes up these really weird, like uncomfortable, awkward. Uh, phrases and you could take a drink every time she does it because she seems to do it like every time she opens her mouth after that point and um there's a lot of there are a lot of other stars in this movie um i can't reveal all all the stars would kind of give away one of the interesting if not weird twists at the end uh but you have uh bill haters in it uh jason bateman um david Kutchner, I can't pronounce his name. He's like the the that guy from uh, what's that movie? Anchorman, like that. His character. Oh yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Jeffrey Tambor. Um, it, it's got it's it's not the worst movie I'd ever seen, but I think I think it's ruined by the fact that you you go in with a different expectation of humor, and honestly, uh. Rogan as Paul why I don't I, I think the timing was because no seriously like you could have probably picked anyone else to voice Paul and it might have done the movie 
You know the biggest, you know the biggest issue, is that I get what Paul is trying to do. It's mm. trying to mix in all these different elements to make one amazing comedy. Because like, right. but the problem is that they don't have all of the components. They only just have some of it. Like they have Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, but they don't have Edgar Wright. They got Greg Manola. But he doesn't have, like, an awkward person to work with, like Michael Sarah or Jesse Eisenberg. They got Seth Rogen, but they don't really have have him work with a lot of things, you know? They're, I don't know, maybe he's, he's missing, um, uh, what, what's his writing partner? Uh, uh, or, no, Greg, Greg, or I think Greg something, not, not the director. Uh, who 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 wrote Pineapple Express, Fudge Nabbit? Um, uh, I think Knocked Up, or... I'm trying to think. Damn it. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I think I got it. Um, James Franco? No. Uh, oh, Evan Goldberg. Oh, Evan Goldberg. It's like, yeah, so this is all the things. Like, you got... Because you got Seth Rogen, but you don't have Evan Goldberg. You only have parts of, like, what makes these co comedies good. You put them all together, they just don't blend well. No. No, they don't. Well, it, it's not going to see this movie to see it, to expect a different kind of comedy. Uh, that's a problem. The problem is going to this movie and expecting comedy. It's, I just didn't, I just didn't, I just didn't, didn't get it. I mean, I... The whole time I was just sitting there, like, what? I, I, all I see here are, all I see here are references to other to other films, and that does not necessarily a comedy make. Um, especially, especially with the Peg and Frost combo, I'm not, and I'm not a huge fan of them either. But uh, at this, uh, at least with their other films. I, I can say that I, I laughed at them. This one, this one I just did not. And Paul, I found to be just kind of a, a it's not Seth Rogen, that's the problem. The problem is he's a, he's kind of an irritating character. I mean, he's, he's supposed to be an elderly alien over 50 years old, but he's, what, uh, dropping his pants and mooning people every chance that he gets. He acts like Seth Rogen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's Seth Rogen, yeah, like Seth Rogen being yeah, Seth that's Rogen. What it is. It's not, he's not doing a character. He's, it's actually Seth Rogen being Seth Rogen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's motion. Seth Rogen being Seth Rogen. They just put the CGI over it's just it like, as well. Yeah. It's just... Why? Why, I, man? It was not... Um, it wasn't it wasn't motion, motion capture. It was just... It was just... No? I thought it was. I, I read in the IMDb that like he couldn't be there for most of it because of the green coordinate. Yeah. Mo yeah. The motion capture kind of. There, there was some elements of it, I believe. Hmm. Like to oh, get okay. to get. I, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't enhance the movie in the slightest. Like, but. Yeah. Here's something Not, curious. I. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I got it here, right here. For much of the filming, Seth Rogen was off filming The Green Hornet, and so was unable to complete, completely inhabit the character Paul's motion and interact with other actors. Jolo Truglio, who also plays O'Reilly in the film, stood in and finished what Rogen didn't complete. He studied, studied Rog Rogen's extens extensively... He studied Rogan extensively in order to impersonate his voice, perform on his knees to capture Paul's physical uh, presence, and even improvised in character as Paul. When filming wrapped, Rogan came in and provided the character's voice. Mm -hmm. So some of it wasn't even uh, no, Seth Rogan. No, it's his voice. So everything's half-assed in this so he it's half it's like not only half ass it's half Seth Rogen 
yeah, he left. He left working on one shitty movie to go work on another another shitty movie. How dare he? How dare that? you say that? Yeah. I like the green hornet. Thank you very much. Oh snap! Oh. And apparently, Seth Rogen asked Andy Serkis for help for the motion capture. Oh. The Gollum dude, yeah. Well, who else are you gonna go to except for the king? <laughs> He's the king yeah, of motion much. capture. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. um, yeah, I, I couldn't help but notice uh, one reference that got overlooked, or actually a couple. Um, you forgot to mention there was a there was a Wilhelm scream in there. Oh, where, yeah. When is the Wilhelm scream? Every single film, come That's on. Sound in any and that this this movie actually gave me the the realization that I'm finally tired of hearing the Wilhelm yeah. scream. You know, uh, because I I was I I watched this movie as a double feature. I had the the movie before it uh, I was watching Due Date also had the Wilhelm scream in it, huh. and I'm just like. Is it is this joke getting tired or what? But um... you know, you know, it actually reminds me. Uh, this sounds unrelated, but in Game Grumps, I remember hearing that, um, like, instead of um, uh, instead of the Wilhelm scream, there's another one that that's much more preferred. Uh, I, I forgot what it's called, but it's like you know what it is when you hear it. It's like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, and there's one video where it's so funny. They showed like it's tie fi- it's like it's the scene in Star Wars where all the tie fighters come in and like like whenever the tie fighters like when you see a tie fighter they use that sound so it's like all the tie fighters come in. Yeah, I didn't mention that. Um I didn't say it last time. I was I forgot to mention it, but in the last episode where Werewolf Films I was watching Trippers vs. Werewolves and that noise was in that film. Exactly. That you yeah! <laughs> Like it was like <laughs> it was The Howie Scream the Howie was scene in there. Was in strippers vs. Werewolves. It's the Howie Scream. It was weird because uh, there's a scene in Strippers vs. Werewolves where the the werewolf gang was killing off these these hoodlums and you see it off screen, they show it like an exterior shot of the parking garage and you hear that Howie scream and I'm like What? <laughs> you know the, the 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 twist is that it comes from a stripper. It's like, oh my god, what are we all doing here? <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, I can turn any man on when a hot chick goes <laughs> the, doing the will, the how we scream. <laughs> so, of course, because this is an alien movie with alien references. I, I also couldn't help but notice the casting of one Sigourney Weaver. Oh, you spoiled it! I didn't want to say that, but yeah, I think it's. Kind um, of a I won't say, I won't say that. Well, I, I won't say what she is here, but I will say this: you watch her role in in Paul, and then you what you watch that back to back with another movie, Cabin in the Woods. Oh. She's the exact same character in both serious? movies. Oh my god! Really? I, I know what you're talking about. Oh my god! No, no. Exact same reveal. No exact same way. everything. No. Oh really? Oh my god. That's kind of lazy. Huh? huh. I wow. guess Drew Goner and uh, Josh Whedon saw Paul, and they're like, "Hey, we'll do that for the end of our movie." <laughs> Let's make that work in our movie. Jeez, like the more I hear about Sigourney Weaver, she sounds pretty shameless in her roles nowadays. Because not only that, like keep in mind, she was also in frickin' That's My Boy. Oh, oh yes. No, 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 that was, yes. no, 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 that was uh, Susan Sarandon. <laughs> Whoops, uh, Sorry. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> Matt, don't get so- Susan Saran confused with Sigourney Weaver. My goodness. That's yeah, a different... <laughs> well, excuse Wait, hold on. Wait. Wrong, washed up Wrong washed up hot actress. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, man. Anyways, <laughs> speaking of... Two- 
Well, can't you? Po- I mean, and if you're listening to this, yeah, Ernie, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> speaking of 2011, I. Oh my God! But they're even so similar. Well, Come on. No, they're no, not. They're complete... oh, they kind of they look, look nothing like alike. They kind of look. Uh, they fit. I mean, hold on. Come on. No. Bit, come on, yeah, a no. bit. No, no. Come on. Can't give them that. Not even close. Yeah, they do. Got to change Kinda. the prescription in your Kinda. closet there, man. Kinda. No. Kinda. Kinda. Well, they're both redheads, but that's about it. <laughs> let it go. I don't, I don't let, it it. go. let it go. Oh. Let come it go. Come on. No. Kind of. Kind of. Let it go. Oh my god. You guys, seriously. Alright, Susan, we. The, like, they would look like sisters. What, what, what we'll you say that. Be, uh, doing a, a, a remake to Thelma and Louise, and so. Because they look so familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Thelma and Louise in space. <laughs> <laughs> With Nate the Clown. <laughs> <laughs> this is the this the, when they when they drive off the cliff at the end of the movie they didn't really fall they took a fly upward and they no, went into space where they fall. No, they reenact E.T. <laughs> I love you, Thelma. I love you, Louise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Same year, another alien feature came out, and it was by the man who is now helming Star Wars, the man known as J.J. Abrams. J.J. Abrams, J.J. Abrams, mind you, uh, made a film in 2011 called Super 8. Oh, 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 yeah. I thought the moment you were going to say Star Trek. That, that yeah, came out. Too. Yeah, I was thinking Star Trek Into Darkness. Yeah. That... yeah. No, no, no. I... Yes, J.J. Abrams has an extensive career in TV and in films. His bad robot company. He's got... He's done a lot of projects. He's all over the place. He's had some writing credits as well. You can check his screenplay writing skills because, my God, the films I've heard of... Oof. Um, but J.J. Abrams, man, and mind you, this was probably, wait, did it? yeah, yeah, because Star Trek came out in 2009, and then, didn't Cloverfield come out in 2000 and, Eight. okay, okay, because that's good, because it's kind of, it kind of has context with the theories on Super 8. I have read that there are theories People are saying, oh, Super 8 is like a prequel to Cloverfield. And I'm like, yeah. what the fuck are you guys talking about? Oh. You guys are stacking the weed too much, man. Uh, Super 8, oh my god. So, it's a retro style, like how Tim Burns' Mars Attack is a homage to the sci- sci-fi 50s and 60s. Uh, Super 8 pays homage to that golden era of film where it's the the kids, the Goonies kind of type of feel, the coming age story, you know, films like E.T., Steve Spielberg has done, and he, he also produced this film as well, so it's kind of a hint hint because they were like, oh, look at what we done. And this takes place in 1979. Um, I found out because you know, they don't tell you what year it was. You find it, at the beginning it's very sad because I, I will tell you right now, Super Eight has a Bambi effect. Where uh, oh so uh-huh. right away did the alien shoot what? down a mom? What? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you mean by the Bambi effect? No, no, no. The alien shoot down Dutch Doom who shoots down no, the mom. No, 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 That's no. That's what no. You guys are all wrong. It, this is an unrelated thing to the alien. The alien comes later in the film. The, the beginning of the film kind of sets the mood where it's like uh, it opens up to a shot of a factory and it's like the guy's changing the accidents, days without accidents, and they change it to one. It's like, oh shit, an accident happened. What happened? 
uh, the kid's mother died in a factory act accident. <laughs> Bambi effect. Uh, oh, and no. so he kind of reflects. He's got like attachment to his mother, and he's got this like little necklace he holds on to throughout the whole film. So he's, but at the end, it's like very. You, you'll see that payoff at the end because. He plays a key yeah, role. Yeah, the necklace plays a key role in the film, and it's just it's beautiful when you see the end, how he moves on with his life. It's very beautiful. Um, Super 8, because of the title, Super 8's all the, the, the portable handheld cameras of the day. Uh, basically, they start out with these group of kids who are filming a film on a Super 8 camera, in order to make it in the, uh, it's set in Ohio, I, I found out until later in the film, it's set in Ohio and Cleveland, I think, no, in Lillian, Lillian, Ohio, and these kids are making this film to submit into the, um, film festival, and this kid, this, this bigger, fatter kid, the, the trope fat kid, he's like all obsessed with film, and he's like, you know, I'm gonna make this film so legit, I'm gonna make this, I'm gonna win the film festival, even though it's like 15, 16 year olds making these films, I'm like a 10, 11 year old, I'm gonna make this film so fantastic, and it, it's a film called The Case, and it's all about this detective, um, trying to, uh, solve crimes with zombies, it's a zombie film, <laughs> there's actually kind of a wink at the end, you'll, if you watch all the way through, with G uh, George Romero, that's kind of cool. Um, so they're they go for locations. There's this massive, and I, I will say this is the best, <coughs> best, best train crash I ever seen in the film. There's a train crash, and they have all they have it on film for the most part. And the twist. Is that there's something on the train? There's something on the train, and we don't know until later on in the film. I'm not gonna reveal it. I mean, of course, this is about this is a podcast about uh, aliens, so it's like, oh shit, it's an alien in the pot in the train. Oh, I spoiled it. Oh, big whoopie do. <laughs> I kind of I counterdict mm -hmm. myself in within two seconds. Um, so what you been smoking I've tonight? Smoking way too much weed, man. Oh man. So, yes, the whole town is all freaked out because the air, uh, the air force is the air force train, and they're the whole town's in panic because the air force is taking over the the um, town, and it's all a big conspiracy because the it's a big government experiment. You know, the alien came, crash landed in 1958, so he's been on the planet for like 20 years at least, and he's trying to get home. He's a misunderstood alien. He's trying to get home, but all the government officials want to do is kill it. It's just like you have sympathy for the alien as you watch the film. It's like, oh, uh, he's killing for a reason. He's just like, he, I want to go home. I want to go home. Leave me alone. The alien, kind of like Cloverfield, you don't see him as much in the film. You kind of, you have to, like, actually pause the film, like, slowly to see good glimpses as the, of the face during some scenes. Like, you try, I, I was doing it, I was like, so close. Oh, jeez, that's a creepy face. And it's kind of a, a mix between, kind of thinking of, like, like, Predator with the mouth, where it kind of opens up, and it's kind of like a spider, and it walks like a monkey. <laughs> Jeez. And he's black too, so it's like a black alien with a predator mouth, and he's he's got all these arms, and it's like a spider, and he walks like a monkey. Do, 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 do. And he's and he's, he's, he's huge. A he's a huge alien compared to the, all the other smaller aliens. He's huge. He's strong. He throws shit around. It's he's just very mysterious as he kills people, and he's and he's like, he kind of like there's some scenes where. The alien, you would see like some chaos happening. It's like, what the fuck's going on over there? And then you see the killing happens. Like, Whoa, where'd that come from, man? So the kids somehow got some of it on the Super 8, and they try to incorporate the whole incident into the film because, oh, it's pr production value. Yes, just because you have a big train crash on film, just because. There's a location where the the uh, Air Force officials are at. It's production value. It's gonna make your film look amazing in comparison. 
<laughs> the kid, this kid is like so fascinated with film. It's unbelievable. It's like production value. Oh, that's mint. That's his catchphrase. That's mint, man. Oh my god, man. That's mint. It's, it's the late 70s. So it's going to be like, yeah, man. That's mint. There's a stoner guy that kind of helps up too in the film. He's just there to drive the kids around. I mean, the train... I'm not going to reveal what happens, what what causes the train crash, because that's actually the big conspiracy, the big experiment behind it. But Super A is, is that film that I was looking for. It's like, I love these coming-of-age stories, because you got a, you got the kid's story, where this young boy falls in love with a girl, and, and the... Nah. <laughs> ew. Ew. <laughs> You're fucking joking. Um... I'm a sucker for those stories. I love the coming of age stories. And that's what yeah, yeah, like JJ Abram wanted to do that. I was reading up where JJ Abram Adram. Oh, that's funny. Adram <laughs> He he had this concept for a long time and there was two things that he wanted to do. He wanted to take a coming of age story and put aliens together with it and you got super A it, pretty much. There's also a mystery between uh, on the train too, where you see these cubes, these little white cubes. There's millions of them on the train, and you don't know what they do until later on in the film, which is kind of clever, actually, really clever. I mean, it's it's the late '70s, mind you, and this little cube is the the most advanced technology you can think of when it comes to this alien. What did do, do, do they take it and it inspired them to make the Rubik's cube? That, that, that maybe could have been, that, because actually there's a throwaway line that says, "Oh, what is this? Is this a Rubik's cube?" Because it did it did come up before this in the um so. It, but the thing, the biggest trope you may notice in all J J Abrams productions is the lens flare. Yes, I was gonna mention. I, I mean, I. To be honest, I I do enjoy this movie. I I, I really do. Um, uh, the funny thing is, though, I I could um, before you even before you even started talking about there, I just just remember sitting back watching this movie, enjoying it, but not really knowing everything that I saw. So, but I do remember one thing: lens flares. Yeah. It's it's like I knew it was a J.J. Abrams film, and I'm like, okay, it's a coming of age story set in the late '70s, early '80s. It's got a, it's got an alien in it. There's gonna be there's no way it's gonna be lens flares in here. And all of a sudden, I see lens flares here and there. I'm like, what the fuck? It's like there's a there's a couple of dark scenes, and all of a sudden there's a lens flare. It's like, how is that even possible? It's, it's <laughs> complete black, and you see the lens flare. It's like, where's that coming from? It just takes me out of the mood sometimes, it's, but it's just, it's something you gotta get over. It's like, it, it's a style uh, thing for him, and it, and it, I, I guess I could kind of see it working for this kind of film, I guess. I mean, I don't know, I, I'm not a huge fan of the lens flare. I mean, in Star, in Star Trek, I didn't mind, because it's a sci-fi uh, epic set in space, but this is a set in, in Ohio in the late 70s, and you don't need this lens flare's crap. Mhm. I mean, yeah. They, well, they they superimpose a lot of those yes, in yes, too. Yes, I know, and I, I realize that they're not. I, I realize they don't do it as they're filming. They do they superimpose it in post and stuff, and it's just like, oh, come on, do something else. Don't do lens flares. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It it gets tiring after a while when people start noticing. God, I, I I could just uh -huh. take the film and actually just do a counter of how many times he does the lens flare. It's so annoying. I mean, J J Abrams drinking game. Uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Jake, every time flare. you see a lens flare, you'll be intoxicated and passed out by then. <laughs> you'll be drink every time you see an homage to another film. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, good God. Not with Super 8. Good. 20 minutes in, like, you're going to call 911. Mm -hmm. uh, in... I'll be like, okay, the military's the bad guy. Uh, E.T., drink. 
<laughs> yeah, I was actually surprised with Super Hit. That's, it was also on my to-watch list for a long time. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to watch it. And in... It... The alien's unique. The creature design is actually pretty different. You don't see it in any other alien movies. Um, the story was great. Actually, you know, I felt for the human characters. I understood the alien's motives. Um, how, why he did this. What he's trying to do. And at the end... Okay, I'm going to... There's a part at the end where the kids go. It's a, it, he's a subterranean alien. He goes under underground. The kids find out where he's at. Um, oh God, I just realized about the kid characters. There's so many tropes. So there's this. There's the fat kid who loves the film to make films. But there's this kid. This kid was so annoying. And it, it was like, shut up, you. Sh this kid had braces. He, he was the brace kid. And he loves explosions. He's he's like the explosion fanatic. He just like I got firecrackers in my backpack, man. I got sparklers, man. You know I'm gonna. And when they're making their film off off on the set, he's like I'm gonna. And he's like cut that out, you motherfucker. <laughs> Ruin the mood. But he does kind of help out at the end, so he's kind of useful to a point but he's just so annoying to me but there's a part at the end this is creepy I, I didn't like this there's a part where the alien picks up the kid and he was gonna try to do something the kid trying to the voice the reasoning it's like don't do this man don't do it you can you know we understand you and the alien's eyes it's like like a, a lizard kind of thing it opens up and it's like these big puppy dog eyes come out like human like eyes come out of the alien i'm like is this cartoonish or something <laughs> like those are not alien eyes those are not it looked too human for me it totally creeped me out it's like what the fuck is with the eyes and the, the alien understood the kid put him down and carried on i was like that was just weird it's so weird <sighs> Yeah. Now, the, the one thing that I uh, I haven't I haven't really seen all of Super Eight, but the one thing that I did understand after hearing from reviews is that this is this is totally trying to be um, a Steven Spielberg yes. movie. Like they, they they try so much to put mm -hmm. in the tropes, like uh, like you said, the Goonies trying to put in like the kid, like the have that trope squad, um, have like the aliens make it more they don't want to make it about the horror they want to make it about the marvel of the aliens like how fascinating these creatures are a little bit like jurassic park or et or something like that and then you got like the government as the bad guys trying to take away the alien which is exactly like et it's like you like super 8 is trying to be like this homage to yeah, steven spielberg exactly that's what um jj abrams was trying to do and steven spielberg who produced the film it it, it, it it they they kind of had this big bond together and they're like you know what this is going to be our passion project and they mm -hmm. i'm going to make an homage to myself <laughs> <laughs> let's make this movie about me <laughs> let's bring that back we don't see those films anymore well it well it is true i mean we don't see those steven spielberg films anymore like nowadays he's making more adult films like lincoln yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like it's and been a while since cameos seen, like... in movies like Paul apparently too. He was Steven Spielberg appeared in Paul. Yeah, he yeah, was boy. a voice cameo. Yeah. Where? It's there. They, in the... Yeah, he's uh, he's talking to Paul, asking for advice on how to make ET. Very meta. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Damn it, Spielberg! What the frick are you doing? <laughs> Like, okay, I'll give you that cameo in Austin Powers, but for God's <laughs> sakes, what are you doing in Paul? Wait, what is he doing in Paul? The kind of, the, uh, on Paul. On Paul? Paul? <laughs> oh, the team. Ooh, Paul. Thanks for the idea. Dog, for man. Uh, 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 uh. 
Don't oh, Paul is don't. bisexual, he said, so that, that was yeah, don't make that you, 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 no. you did word it right, so that's what I can't. Paul Bird. Paul Bird. Ew, just, no. Just <laughs> I'm going to check out more of uh, Chris Sanders' work to watch that out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I dare you to watch this out. <laughs> What's that? What the fridge? I see chin. I see skin cells. Okay. James, did you fell? <laughs> the lab that you dork. Uh, uh, Alright. Oh. Wait. Oh, wait. Oh, technically, well, okay. The only recent Steven Spielberg film we had was was uh, The Adventures of Tintin. But, yeah, yeah. okay. Well, that was, I mean, that was the only yeah. one. He directed like, that? Didn't he? No, yeah. he no, he directed Tintin. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, he yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. He directed Tintin. The next one, um, he's going to let Peter Jackson direct it while he's a producer. Okay. So, like, they're kind of switching. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Of course. No wonder it was a good mocap movie. I know. It was so good. I love it. <laughs> Would we, can, can it be considered underrated or is it pretty popular? I haven't Adventures seen it. Adventures of Tintin. Oh, my God. you got to yeah. see it. I want to see it though. But is it considered underrated now, or? Uh, I don't think so. I don't hear people talking about it. Okay. At least it's not like flew under the flew under the okay, radar good. kind of thing. It's, good. It's, but because no, uh, I just saw I just saw it on TV uh, today. And I'm like, oh god. Oh, Wait, so who's awesome. showing it? What channel? <laughs> not uh, Teletoon. Oh, I don't have Teletoon. You don't have Teletoon? What? We have the worst cable here. We have, like, YTV, and that's it. We don't have Teletoon. Wow! Yeah, we have, like, the basic of the basic cable. If I didn't know what it was on, I'd probably be watching that. Yeah. Even when I had cable, I still had Teletoon. Like, I even had the French one. Cinema Royale. Oh, my God. Into our personal lives. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> it's not our personal lives. This is freaking Canada. This yeah. is... This is basic logic in freaking Canada. Super 8 is a film that if you love these coming to age stories mixed with the, the the era that it was set in, you know, the late 70s. I kind of dig the music in it. There, there's this uh, whole scene where they're at a gas station, the sheriff's there, and this clerk's like has a Walkman on, he's playing a heart, uh... And he's playing Blondie Heart of Glass, and he's just like, I got a, I got a Walkman, Sheriff, and, and the Sheriff's like, eh, eh, now the Walkmans of the world. Now, what's gonna be next? It's gonna, so consumerism kind of crap. It's kind of meta kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, like I said, the alien attacks very mysteriously throughout the film, and you, you kind of like, what is this force? Like, you don't, you see these little things. Like, you hear a creep, or you, you you see something being thrown, like there's the, the scene at the gas station. You know, the the guy's hearing his he's has his headphones on and he can't hear shit, and he can't even hear an alien attacking the sheriff in the background. Like you see the 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 sheriff was being thrown around, the the cop car is all thrashed up, and and the the guy <laughs> at the gas station is just like, oh. And there's a couple of those because there's a lot of reaction shots because you don't see the alien that much until, you know, later on. And you've got to watch all the way to the end, to the end credits, because you wonder, wait, what about the Super 8 film? Is that done and finished? Did they send it into the, the film festival? You get your payoff at the end during the end credits where they actually show the Super 8 film they were filming throughout the whole film all the way through. Which is something you should do, because you see them filming it, but you don't know what the end result is, and it's something you should actually check out. And you think, wait, does the kid actually win the film festival? Because that looked pretty darn good. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to take my Super 8 film and film something. Coming soon in Super 9. (laughs) I was thinking about no because i was thinking about that theory of how super 8 was no no because no. i was thinking about this like super 8 was set in 79 and i was like wait a minute you could actually 
have a sequel where it's set in the future, kind of with the same characters, you know, with old, as adults, and same something similar happens with the alien again for some reason. As for a sequel, I don't know. I was still like, that's a super good film. Literally. I mean, obviously we didn't talk about Alien or Predator in this episode, so we had to talk about something else. <laughs> yeah, we talked to... Yeah, we went, like, in all different corners. Yeah, good. We had to pick out the good ones. We talked about the bad ones. <laughs> the, the bad ones, yeah. <laughs> Although, like, I'll be honest. <laughs> Mine was worse than freaking Paul. <laughs> like, I, I ta- I'd even take Paul than freaking Escape from Planet Earth. <laughs> Wow. Not bad. Wow. Hey, hey at least, at least a Steve, at least a Seth Rogen Paul, a, a Seth Rogen alien is something. I take that over dumbass Brendan Fraser alien. Oh. Oh. Mm. So yeah, that's pretty much our discussion on aliens in film. Uh, there's plenty of others we didn't men- we mentioned ET, but we didn't talk about ET that much. I mean. There's, there's a shit ton. I mean, the first Alien film was in 1902. I mean, with um, Fly Me to the Moon, I believe, that silent film where it's um, they shoot the rocket, it's in the moon's face, that iconic film. That was 122 years ago, mm-hmm. so it's still going on today. I mean, aliens have fascinated our, our, our ways. Collective yeah, imagination. Because... I think you mean a trip to the moon. Ah, that's what it was. Trip. Wick and Nudge Nudge. George Malays. Get your, get I'm your sorry, title straight. Cause I, sorry. Jeez. I need to watch my silent movies more often. Jeez. Maybe we should talk about that in a future episode. I don't know. God. Ooh, there's a subject. There's a subject. Something that totally would leave us in the dark. I don't know. It's, it's totally different for me. But uh, it's the end of the episode, and... Honestly, none of you guys don't know what the next topic is, and seriously, it's sci-fi month, then think about it. We would, we did Aliens, but what's the next logical step for sci-fi month? Space? Robots. Robots. James hit it right on the dinger. Uh, Robots. Uh. Robots. Oh, Robots. Snap. We check out Z robots and how they affected sci fi films. What do you know? I've got Sleeper on my watch list with Woody Allen. You know, since oh. Wally is an, uh, an honorable mention today. And, and, and <laughs> I was shocked when you said Wally. I was like, that's the next topic. <laughs> well, I didn't know. Loophole, loophole. But come on. But, hey, 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 hey. I didn't talk about Wally itself. I only talked about the concept that was yes. originally going to be in Wally, but not that didn't make it. So, this has been Cinema Royale. I am MikeBot2000 saying goodbye and good night. What is your favorite alien movie? Mine is Predator and Super 8. And Invasion of the Body Snatchers. That's my top three. Crap, we need Ciao to make for a top now. <laughs> See you later, dudes. I gotta say something. Oh my god. Uh, control, I'll delete. Control, I'll delete. No, no, abort, no. Abort, uh, abort, abort, <laughs> fail, fail inch. Does not compute, does not compute. No, 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 abort, no. Abort, abort, abort.